All right. So the other go arounds. Uh, so, so like, what's a go around? A go around is basically a landing reject, right? We're going to reject the landing. Got, who knows why? Crosswind, deer on the runway. We don't know. To reject the landing, you do a go around. Go arounds are taught early. Uh, in fact, uh, according to, uh, well, if I quote the FAR number, I'll be wrong, but it's the student pilot training. Uh, we, uh, instructor can't even solo a student unless they've done takeoffs, landings, and go arounds. Uh, and go arounds get tested on the private check ride. There's nothing except maybe in the discussion section of a check ride, uh, which I'll show you about um, takeoff rejects. You don't have to demonstrate a takeoff reject until maybe commercial or, in, or CFI it, down the road. So you can be a private pilot without ever having rejected a takeoff. I, 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 I don't like that. <laughs> because there are lots of reasons to reject the takeoff and uh, we need to know how to do it safely. We also know how to need to know how to predict our takeoff performance so that we know whether we need to reject. So I'm using reject and abort interchangeably. My understanding is reject is a more appropriate term. So I'm gonna try to stick with reject. So I like to know who's talking to me. So there's my fancy stuff up there. I'm on my 10th airplane. Uh, the, which is my third T-18, which is this beautiful girl. She'll be here for a few more hours until I pack up after this presentation and take off out there by the Brown Arch. Please go and show her some love if you want. And uh, I'm from way out there in uh, Oregon. As I said, that's Twin Oaks Air Park near PDX, near Hillsboro. And uh, at Twin Oaks is where we make dreams come true. Did you read the bottom of the slide? <laughs> That's me in the airplane. Okay, why am I talking about takeoff rejects? Well, guess what? You are not a bird. We're born being able to do this, right? We're not born being able to do that. Birds are born able to do that. They walk kind of clumsy, but when mama bird decides it's time for baby bird to go fly, she kicks the bird out of the nest. It either learns right now or it learns after a few bounces how to get themselves going, and then it's built in. And they know when to take off. They know what the wind is. They know it's just built in, just like us walking on uneven ground. We don't have to think about each step. Birds can fly, and if there's a little too much lift on one side because of a gust, they just lower the angle of attack on that wing. It's like, it's trivial for them. So you are not a bird. And Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. The updated version of which is everything that can go wrong usually goes right. But then we draw the wrong conclusion, which is what? That it will always go right. So we've taken off zillions of times. Airplane engines are rock solid, reliable until they're not. We need to be ready for those knots. So private pilot ACS, uh, part of the uh, requirements are risk management, abnormal operations to include planning for rejected takeoff, uh, engine trouble and takeoff and climb phase of flight. And this is all in the discussion section that never has to be demonstrated. The only thing that has to be demonstrated is under skills, confirm takeoff power and proper engine and flight instrument indications prior to rotation. That's the private ACS. Instrument, recognize simulated wing contamination. There isn't even anything about engine issues or any other type of reject. Commercial ACS, risk management. You're gonna discuss abnormal operations to include planning for rejected takeoff. Skills, exactly the same as private. Confirm takeoff power and proper engine and flight indications. Finally, when it gets to um, uh, ATP, you're going to conduct a briefing that in includes abnormal operations to include planning for rejected takeoff and an area of operation three, task one, rejected takeoff. The applicant demonstrates the ability to abort the takeoff. So it's not the commercial or the CFI, it's the ATP. And most people go private commercial instrument CFI, train a bunch of people, Maybe then, eventually, when they get their 12 or 1,500 hours, go get ATP. 
So that means that that person and everyone they train may not be getting rejected takeoff uh, practice and and uh, training and takeoff predicting and monitoring. The CFI practical test standard is completely silent. Except way down on the before takeoff checklist, observe that the appellant exhibits instructional knowledge and things like that, but it doesn't even have to be demonstrated. So I did a little research and I said, uh, looked at the Joseph T. Null report, the AOPA report, and I focused on uh, non-commercial fixed wing aircraft landing. And then separately, I'm gonna show you non-commercial fixed wing, the next tab, take off and climb. And what I wanna know is, as a percentage of landing accidents, how many are fatal? Like, how bad is this? So for single engine fixed gear, the lethality in, uh, I think this is for the year 2020, latest available, the lethality was 0.8%. Let's just call it 1%. So landing accidents, roughly 1% are fatal. I mean, 0.0001% is too many, but 1% uh, end up being fatal. Non-commercial fixed wing takeoffs and climbs, lethality 10.9% take off at initial climb accidents. You're 11 times more likely to die if you're accelerating and trying to go up as opposed to landing or let's say maybe rejecting a takeoff where you're at least slowing down. So part of the reason for that might be what? How does the your energy, your kinetic energy relate to your your speed, your ground speed? What's the relationship between energy speed and energy? The square yeah, I'm very hard to hear. <laughs> I can't hear you at all over that noise, but I think I heard square law. So, so 60 knots, what's 60 squared? 3,600 versus 40 knots, 40 squared is 1,600. 1,600, so that's less than half the energy at 40 knots versus 60 knots. Just pretend I did the math right. Much less energy, less than half, even though you're going 40 versus 60. Half of 60 is 30, but at 40, it's already less than half the energy. So the slower you whack into something, the less energy has to be dissipated and therefore the less G hits on your body. So that's why it's 1% in landing accidents is one of the reasons. 1% lethal in landing accidents versus 11% in takeoff accidents. So I'm gonna sneak out here where they told me I'll still be in range and I need you to shout like crazy. Raise your hand first so I can see who's speaking. Reasons to reject the takeoff, so just name one. Loss of power, okay. Yep, that's great, I'll repeat them. Thank you, it's, you're gonna run around like crazy. Go ahead. Something on the runway. I was taken off out of Twin Oaks once and that, that bird wasn't gonna move. Usually they have you know an instinct for self-preservation and this one clearly knew how to fly already. <laughs> just, I'm like, we need to reject. This stupid thing is not gonna move. This is not gonna go well for the bird or the propeller. Uh, what else? No airspeed, right? Airspeed alive or or not, right? One more. Uh huh. You say again? Tire, tire issues. Okay, good, beautiful. I love it. Uh, I'm gonna add one that I didn't put in the slide because Brian had just mentioned it to me. Uh, when he does a flight review, he'll open his or the the um, pilot's door at 20 or 30 knots on a takeoff, and he says most of them continue. Maybe that's the right thing to do, but if it's really only 20 or 30 knots and a door pops open, you got time and room, you got all day long to reject. So uh, if it happens right at rotation, maybe the best thing to do is continue, uh, come back and land, deal with the door. But at, at a low speed, mm, it's probably a reject. All right, here's another reason. All right, so hopefully you can see the panel. Um, yeah, so watch the panel. Yeah, whole panel went dark, except whatever that, that's still flickering in there. 
uh, and she rightly rejected the takeoff. She goes by Schmindy. Mindy Lindheim was kind enough to give me permission for this section of this video. So there's something we don't usually think about. Electrical failure. Great reason to reject the takeoff if you're not already in a position where you can't stop, right? Um, all right, here's another one. This is a fun one. So hold on one second before you launch the one you're about to launch. Uh, so I sent, so I, this is a still, and then I'll show the video. But what's wrong with this picture? So, yeah, right, correct. So I, I sent this to, uh, to our uh, chair, Karen Kalashek, and said, hey, look, Karen, I discovered another reason to reject the video. And she's, uh, she's got a keen eye, and she goes, oh, I know, the Cessna in the upper left is out of focus. Yeah, bouncy, bouncy on the uh, oil door. It's very short, so. That's great, thank you. So uh, <clears throat> so this happened. This was in the 150 I was instructing in. Uh, interesting thing is from his side, from the left side, he can't even see that because it's just kind of doing this. If, when it really bounces up, he would catch, uh, it would catch his eye, but it was right in front of me. And I'm like, uh, um, um, and he took that as, <laughs> you know, I couldn't figure out what to say right away. And he took that as a sign to reject, because why not? Uh, so we did. So it's not that he hadn't latched it. It's just on those old 150s, those little quarter turns get really loose. And if you're not really like, ah, get it in there, pull on it, uh, and hope it stays, sometimes they get loose. Sometimes one of them comes loose and the door kind of does this or does this. Perfect reason to reject the takeoff. Why? Because if that thing really comes loose, it can scratch the... Um, a scratch the windscreen, it can go back and hit somewhere, something on the tail and cause a big ding in the tail. Uh, so uh, that, that seemed like an interesting reason to reject. Uh, and then there's, it uh, turns out that this uh, uh, seminar is actually coming up on August 2nd, which is all about quarter turn, quarter turn fasteners, like those little ones on the 150 or the ones that hold cowlings in place uh, on a lot of aircraft, including mine. Why? Because this can happen. So hopefully you find it during pre-flight. If not, and you detect it during the takeoff roll, that's a great time to reject. All right, here's another one, also used with permission uh, from Daniel Mosier. He aborted the takeoff in, uh, in the students' correction, learners' super cub because the tailwheel wasn't re-engaging. And any tailwheel pilots? Right, so you know you can kick out the tailwheel and it free casters, and then when you want it to snap in, you get it right behind you, and now you have tailwheel steering, and most tailwheels, some of them don't kick out. Uh, but if it, doesn't, uh, if it doesn't latch, you don't have good ground control. All you got is your rudder and brakes, and that's, that's not as good as having a solid tailwheel control. He told me uh, afterwards by phone that it actually was only half bad, like, he could push the tail wheel to the right, but when he went to the left, it was free castering. So half bad is even worse than all bad, because now you can't balance your feet. So that's a good reason to reject. Airspeed alive, someone said. So I put this in there, because this happened uh, with a, a fellow I was with. A C, so this is a CFI applicant. So uh, right, private, private commercial instrument, uh, whichever order. And, uh, and now he's going for his CFI. So uh, his normal instructor asked me to fly with him uh, as a substitute. So uh, we're in a 150. And he doesn't really do any takeoff briefing. It's like, I'm just going to watch and see what happens. And then feedback will happen. <clears throat> so we start taking off. Uh, he calls out airspeed alive. And it gets up to 40. And it stays there. It might have hit 45. 2,600-foot runway, it's just a 150, still plenty of room to stop. Maybe it got up to 45. We were clearly still accelerating by sound and by sight and feet, right? The thing's still accelerating, but the airspeed just won't go higher than 45. Who would reject that takeoff? Me too. He kept going. He kept going. So we took off. Thing never got above 45 indicated. Clearly, there was more because he had good control. 
he was ready to go out and go practice, you know, show off his stalls and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, uh, you know what? Something's not operating correctly. Something that's important, something that's part of the type certificate, required equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Like this airplane needs to be on the ground. So he managed to get it on the ground using attitude control. So I'm happy about that. But um, we had a little discussion afterwards. So airspeed alive, yes. And if you catch it, you know, if, if you have time to look at it, here's the problem. Takeoffs are busy and your primary responsibility is directional control, right? And then rotation. So you can, sometimes you can only glance, but if you happen to glance when you think it should be saying 60 or 70 and it's stuck somewhere less than that, if you can abort, uh, correct and reject, uh, maybe you should. Um, uh, so we brought it in and uh, I squawked it and the uh, mechanic came right out, followed the plumbing from the, Peter, I thought maybe we caught a bug or something like that, right? But nothing, we can't do anything about it. We need a mechanic to blow out the bug or do what it, whatever it needs. And they just found a joint where the, you know, plastic tube and a plastic tube and a joint, that joint had come loose so that that pressurized air from the pitot tube was leaking out of that joint partly. So that's why it didn't give enough uh, indication. All right. So how to reject. And this depends to some extent on the airplane, but I, you know, stick with single engine, simple airplanes, warriors, and uh, you know, Cessnas and things like that. So uh, typically it's gonna be something like this, throttle to idle, elevator slightly tail low, rudder, rudder pedals, let's say, maintain directional control, brakes, a lot of those checklists say maximum braking. What do you think of that? that that's sort of a recipe for losing control because the brakes are, you know, the tires are going to skid. You're going from acceleration mode to deceleration mode, and it, that's just hard to make that transition right away. I'm not sure why it says maximum. So I teach, yeah, it says maximum, like, as required. Don't skid the tires. You know how much runway you have left. You, you could probably sit there without any brakes until you get near the turnoff. So be judicious with brakes. Really, that acceleration to deceleration is a bigger deal than you think. And when you go out and practice it, hopefully with an instructor, um, you'll discover that. Uh, and then some of them say flaps up for an airplane that might be taking off with flaps down. Maybe you have 10 flaps in your Cessna because it's a soft field takeoff. Moonies take off with half flaps. Other aircraft take off with partial flaps. Uh, what reason might there be for raising the flaps during a reject? Since I can't hear you, I'll pretend I heard you. <laughs> Getting rid of the lift, putting the weight on the wheels. You gotta weigh that versus maintaining directional control and way up on the list if it's a retract, accidentally raising the gear. So be real judicious with the flaps, get it slowed down so you can concentrate um, and, you know, if it's braking and slowing down and you have enough runway left, what's the rush? All right, so this is right out of a Cessna 172N, throttle idle, brake supply. It doesn't say how hard, so that's great. It's up to the pilot. Wing flap retract. I, again, I'm like, why? What's the rush? Then they keep going. I mixture idle cut off, you know, shut the thing down on the runway. I mean, yes, if there's smoke, if you expect the firewall forward fire, yeah. Shut the thing down, get out before it takes off. It's on its own uh, in fire. But um, so that's going to be a judgment call. If you're slowing down because you detected a, a soft tire, why shut it down? You know, power off the runway. All right. So. Uh, this kind of relates to reasons to take off. Uh, seats adjust. And what if the seat slides back during the takeoff roll? Do you want to reject? I sure would. <laughs> yeah. Bit of a different issue if it takes off uh, during initial climb. And, you know, that's why Cessna puts in those stops, so at least you can't go all the way back to the baggage compartment. It'll stop you a little bit sooner than that. But if you're a little bit vertically challenged and all of a sudden you run out of legs and arms, 
you might end up doing this to yourself. So in this case, I'm just saying instructors discuss this with your students, help them figure out how to stay upright and not yank on the nose. Typically you hold on to that nut where the throttle is and make sure you hold yourself forward with that and control the airplane, get to a safe altitude and then figure out your seat, come back and land and get it all fixed up. Uh, safety belts. Yeah. Say again. That's, that's a very good point. That's why it's important to set takeoff trim. Very good point. Yeah, very good point. Right. So you can kind of hang on to the uh, nut and just let the elevator do what it does because you've trimmed it for takeoff. That's beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, all right. So seat belts tight. Uh, and I'm not sure why I put that there, but so let's keep going. So uh, now comes the juicy part. Verbalize out loud the indications that you're going to be looking for during takeoff. Before you take the runway, what I teach my students is before you start the engine. And like, I haven't even started the engine yet. I'm like, that's right. You have time to think, visualize, point, tell me what you're going to be looking for, tell yourself what you're going to be looking for, use your hands, show me the where that airspeed indicator needle is going to be at rotation time, show me your initial climb speed, take your time, talk it through, then do it again after the run-up before takeoff. So uh, you're going to be watching uh, oil pressure. You just did a run-up, that's fine. If you've seen my power loss at 300 feet video, you know that the run-up went fine, and yet we lost all our oil by the time we got up to 300 feet. So things break when they break. They don't break when you want them to break. Uh, so you're going to be watching for oil pressure. That's that indicator right there, and there's the green section. Um, RPM, you want to know your static RPM for that aircraft, not... For example, for a Cessna 150, we have five, I think, Cessna 150s at Twin Oaks where I teach. There are at least three different uh, engine prop combinations, and they all result in different static RPM requirements. Static RPM means full throttle on the ground, not moving. Uh, one of them is 24 to 2500. One of them is 2460 to 2560. So you need to know what it is for that airplane, not for that model, because the engine may have been souped up, the prop may have been changed, climb prop versus cruise prop and things like that. So you need to know what that is. That's why you want to do this before starting engine, because you may need to look it up in the book. All right. So uh, minimum static RPM, if fixed pitch, if red line, if, excuse me, if it's constant speed prop, generally it's red line and not above. And uh, takeoff power check. So out of the um, Cessna 150 POH, uh, it is important to check full throttle, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, this engine should turn approximately 2,500 to 2,600. That was for a 1969 Cessna 150. For a 1977, it says 2,460 to 2,560. So for that airplane, and then you may need to look and see if there have been any uh, changes. Are there any STCs? that would modify that. All right, so that's important to know, otherwise you don't know if you're getting full thrust on your engine. All right, so verbalize. Oil pressure is gonna be in the green. You're looking for a minimum RPM. Uh, manifold pressure, if equipped, what's the manifold pressure gonna be? So whether it's turbocharged or non-turbo is gonna be uh, uh, different questions. Uh, so let's just pretend we're non-turbo for now, just keep it simple. So uh, my first question is, let's say we're here relatively near sea level and the altimeter setting is 30 inches. Uh, it's not a bad idea to look at that instrument before you start anything, right? Just leave the engine, the, nothing, no start, don't turn on the mags, don't do anything. Look at the manifold pressure gauge. If the altimeter setting is 3000, what should the manifold pressure indicator say? 30 inches. Okay, so now you start the engine. Uh, it goes way down because of the because the cylinders are sucking past the butterfly. Eventually, you go to full throttle. So it was 30 inches because that's atmospheric pressure. 
what is it now at full throttle? It's not 30. And you shouldn't expect 30. Why? Because there's losses through that intake system. And then it depends on where that manifold pressure gauges and stuff. But typically, it loses an inch or an inch and a half. My airplane loses roughly an inch and a half. If it's 30, I'll get 28 and a half. A little bit more as I move forward, because then you get ram pressure help into the uh, air filter. Uh, so um, you need to know what that is if you're manifold pressure equipped. All right, airspeed alive, but how alive? So we discussed that earlier. <laughs> Uh, any other indications? What else do you want to look for? All right. So then, the, it, so take off a board point. So the entire rest of the seminar is going to be about that, and it's going to take a half hour, and I only have 15 minutes. So we'll fly through it because you'll get the idea, and I want you to be able to make these predictions and come to these conclusions. So um, verbalize the specific abort point, and we're going to figure out what that is in just a minute. And <laughs> you verbalize it out loud, and you want to choose it in such a way that you'll know when you're there from the cockpit, right? It's not enough to say, you know, look at a chart and say it's going to be at 823 feet. What does that mean? What does that mean on that runway? And how are you going to know when you're there? One thing that doesn't work is counting stripes, because anything that goes by you, you're going to lose count. What's easier is to count what's in front of you, and what actually works pretty well. And if you're on an instrument runway like this with 1,000-foot markers, that's 1,000 feet. It's typically 200 feet per stripe before that. So if you're 800 feet, it's like 1,000-foot markers, the beginning of the first stripe before that. Now it's in front of you. So here comes that marker. Airspeed is right at rotation speed. You're off the ground. Perfect. You wouldn't believe how satisfying that is, actually. When I started doing this, it's like, oh my god, physics works. This is incredible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's actually kind of fun. All right. Now this. Uh, I haven't seen Catherine here all week, Catherine Cavaniero. She's usually around doing a lot of speaking. Read and listen to anything Catherine Cavaniero puts out there. And uh, so there's an Aviation News Talk um, interview with Max Trescott she did recently that tells you, talks about how inappropriate, I'm putting it very nicely, the 70-50 rule is. Uh, and she also wrote, has an article in the June uh, AOPA Pilot Magazine on page 81 uh, that talks about the, um, the myth of the 70-50 rule. So you'll find out why that is. So first of all, the 70-50 rule typically is you want to be at at least 70% of your rotation speed by 50% of the runway length. The first way to realize how silly that is, uh, you're taking off in your Mooney from this, what is it, 5,000 foot runway, runway 36, maybe, mile long runway roughly. If you go by that rule, you need to be at your rotation speed is 70 knots, let's say, in a Mooney. So 70% of that is 50 knots. So if you're going to go 2,500 feet and you're only at 50 knots, that just can't be right because the actual takeoff roll is only 900 or 1,000 feet. So just dump this. Just get rid of it completely. I forbid you from ever saying that again. <laughs> there is no 70-50 rule. I'll track you down. <laughs> All right. Now, I've been yakking about verbalizing the, the rotation speed, oil pressure, uh, green, um, you know, the other indications, uh, and predicting it, and re verbalizing the abort point, which we're going to get to. Why verbalize it? Why not just think about it and go yada yada? Even if you're alone, I do this and I'm in my airplane, nobody's watching me. I'm chatterbox just as if there was a DPE or FAA inspector next to me. And the question is why? This is called the production effect. And uh, according to this article from uh, I forget which journal I grabbed this from, but it's um, these authors, Foran and McLeod, 
Uh, it says the production effect is the memory advantage of saying words aloud over simply reading them or thinking them. So it is actually a name for this. This has been researched. It's uh, good scientific evidence that if you say what you're going to do, say what you're going to look at, say what you're going to be monitoring for, much more likely that you'll do it than if you just think about, oh, I'll be off the ground at some point. So when I take off from my old home airport, which I've done hundreds of times in my airplane, I know I'm going to be off by, by the time I'm a beam the second hangar row. doesn't matter. I'm, when I talk about what I'm going to look for, I'm like, there's the second hangar row. That's what it looks like from the runway. OK, here I go. So uh, naturally, leave no runway behind. Um, Please run the taking off from Twin Oaks, if you would, Andrew. So this is uh, me taking the runway, I think. Yeah, from Twin Oaks, so it's got to be me. It has to be me. It has to be me. All right. That's my beautiful little airplane. And see where the edge of the runway is, and I'm going to just make the tightest turn I can without losing the tail into those run into those uh, runway lights. Yeah, you can pause right there. We're going to keep going in a second. Whoops. That's all right. Yeah, but so see how tight that turn was? Most people will, a lot of people will follow the yellow line. That puts you out like two or 300 feet. What's useless to a pilot? Runway behind, altitude above, and fuel in the underground tanks, right? Runway behind is useless. All right, see the hangars on the right? So I, I, I don't know what the temperature was, so I'm either off by the first one or second one. Absolutely by the second one. Low pressure good, RPM good, fuel flow good, airspeed alive in two places. Okay, pause in two, one, now. Okay, good, right there. So I'm just about to get airborne. I'm just passing the second row of hangars. All right, please continue. Three, two, one, stop. That's the midway point of the runway, this turn off. I'm already several, you know, a dozen or two feet high. What if I was only at 70% of my rotation speed by then? I'd be in the trees at the far end on the ground. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay, that's good. Everything after that is just showing off my beautiful airplane. But see what I mean? 7050, just can it. It's gone. Okay, leave no runway behind. And as I said sort of earlier, don't just verbalize, move your body, use your kinesthetics. <laughs> Put your, like, um, that's the airspeed I'm looking at. That's where the oil pressure indication is. That's my fuel flow. Really train your brain where to look. Because when you're doing that takeoff roll, your first job, of course, is directional control. You want to be, okay, what was that? Where's my oil pressure? Train yourself to see it in advance. Like that, like that, like that. There's uh, manifold pressure, fuel flow, if, you're, if you have an indication. We talked about what manifold pressure to expect. Another one I grabbed off internet and uh, uh, very kind permission from the um, uh, from the videographer, uh, and I found it on Catherine's report. Are you familiar that that documents accidents? Uh, and so this is a Turbo Lance uh, somewhere in Texas, a grass runway in Texas, beautiful looking place. And in 2000, so a year ago, July 4th last year, uh, Piper Lance. And the uh, aircraft departs the runway, attempting to abort with kind permission from uh, Mr. Murray. Your double. This pilot is about to have a really bad day. The plane is taking off in this air park in Texas, where you can taxi up to your own front door. The plane was in good working order, and the weather was fine. 
but there were large trees at the end of the runway and a hidden obstacle about halfway down. The pilot reported having enough speed to take off, but just as he hit the halfway mark, there was an elevation change in the runway that caused the nose to drop. This made the trees appear to grow 20 feet and made the runway look shorter than it was. The pilot instinctively tried to abort the takeoff, but with the wet grass and high speeds, he was unable to stop in time. He's gonna wreck it. The plane ran past the end of the runway and was heavily damaged. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. He hit. And that's why this pilot is about to have a... <laughs> yeah. yeah, like that. Okay, so uh, uh, I don't mean to disparage anyone, but maybe if he had had a abort point in mind and wasn't airborne by then, maybe he would have been able to stop in time. I don't know. Uh, so uh, let's see. Click to the next one. So we're going to have to scream pretty fast. And again, I want to give you the idea of to make sure you know how to predict these points and also how to make sure you have enough room to stop. So uh, I just uh, dug into the Skyhawk XP and I said, okay, let's just pretend I'm at that weight. My uh, predicted uh, takeoff uh, ground roll is gonna be 770 feet under certain conditions, total to clear a 50 foot obstacle of 1300 roughly. So 770 is the most important one because that you can't abort once that's not true. All right, so 77, 770, but that's under what conditions? So they're doing a short field takeoff because that's where they like to advertise their uh, performance. So flaps 10, full throttle prior to brake release, as you know. This would be measured on a paved dry runway. Zero wind, liftoff speed 44, speed at 50 feet, and so on. But... Here are the uh, changes you need to apply if it's not a, um, what happened? Conditions or that. I uh, can't quite get to it. Short field takeoff. Okay, uh, I thought I expanded that little box. I'll get to it in just a second. So what we're gonna do is uh, analyze taking off from the east-west runway at Parlin Field in New Hampshire actually pretty similar to the Turbo Lance runway we just saw. So turf runway surrounded by trees. So uh, those are the uh, 770 and 1300 are the, are the capabilities of the airplane on drive paved runway and so on. So, uh, but, uh, da, 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 so decreased distances for 10% for each nine knots of headwind. It's much worse if you have a tailwind. Uh, but in terms of the calculation for operation on dry, dry grass runway, increased distances by 15% of the ground roll figure. Once you're off the runway, it doesn't matter if it was grass or pavement, right? So, um, so we have to we have to modify our prediction, add that 15%, and that uh, implies. They don't say it, but that's they're going to pick a you know shortcut, well maintained, flat, <laughs> no no little divots in the runway, and maybe you'll get off in 15% longer than the paved. So here's that runway, and let's just say we brought a student in here to show them uh, turf runway operations. We need to calculate this all in advance because if not, we're going to have trouble, and here's why. So the the runway is 1980 feet long. And um, we're going to have some conditions uh, with that eventually, once we adjust for the conditions and add the 15%, we're now predicting um, 885 feet instead of 770, right, for the ground roll, and distance over a 50-foot obstacle of 1430. So uh, is this thing working? Yes. A little bit hard to see. So 1430. However, 50 foot obstacles only exist in airplane flight manuals. Trees grow as big as they grow. And these beautiful trees in New Hampshire are easily 100 feet tall, just like probably the ones in that Turbo Lance video. So we need to figure out how much more horizontal distance we need to make the next 50 feet. So different ways to do it. I just said, well, there's there's the ground roll and then that distance to the 50-foot obstacle, and I'm just going to duplicate that distance.
for the next 50 feet. So I just took took the air distance, added that distance, and it's like, okay, let's just say that gets us over a 100-foot obstacle. So the total is 1975 feet. The runway is only 1980 feet. You cannot safely take off from this runway in this airplane under these conditions. Okay, now, next question. Uh, it's uh, 885 feet, assuming it does book values for the turf runway. Where are you gonna position the airplane for takeoff? So I hope you can see the east-west runway there. There's, there's sort of some flat ground before it. You don't have to be deep into the runway, right? So position your aircraft always as far back as you can. Leave no runway behind. I don't know if you could start on the pavement there. I don't know if there's little divots or whatever, but always, right, get your tail over the start of the runway. If you can, thou shalt not waste runway. All right. So uh, here's our calculated takeoff point. How do we know what to look for from the cockpit? So I put that star there to show that it's roughly 45% of the runway length. It's just uh, 885 divided by the length of the runway. Stick that asterisk there, then go over to the actual runway. There's nothing to look at. How are you going to know that you're there? This is a problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, you might be able to talk to someone with a car there and say, please go out to this point, try to figure out where it is with respect to the trees, park about 30 or 40 feet off the side of the runway so I can see you in my peripheral vision. And if I'm not off by the time I pass you, I'm going to abort. You got to have something to look at. So most runways, you're going to have a windsock or an intersecting taxiway or something. But uh, if you don't, you might have to invent something. All right. So let's say you're rolling along. You get up to your, your beam that car. You're like, no, we're not moving, getting off the runway yet. This this. Turf runway is a little more rough than when they did their marketing back then in 1986 or whatever. So uh, so we're going to have to abort. Great. What's our stopping distance? So in, in airline operations, that's called accelerate stop distance, and there's all kinds of regulations about that. So why not do that with our airplanes? Why do we have to wait for ATP and jets, right? This is all everything that's a good idea that the airlines do that makes them way safer than us. Let's bring that down to our level and, and do it with our little airplanes. So uh, stopping distance uh, under those conditions, 605 foot ground roll. And that assumes you've come in and you just landed, you got full flaps, et cetera. So uh, now we have to fix it um, because we're not flaps 30, we're not dry level pavement. We have to fix it for, um, uh, okay, we'll get there. Here we go. Decrease distances for the headwind. We're going to, we can't count on the headwind because there's trees. There is wind over the trees, but as you know, it comes down past the trees and does you don't know what. So you cannot count on that headwind. Uh, so, um, so for operation on a runway, increase stopping distances by 45%. The penalty for takeoff, theoretically, is only 15%, right? But that's because you're not counting on friction against the ground to, to get you going. Stopping, now you've got to get friction against the grass without locking the wheels, right? Because you lose braking effectiveness as soon as the wheels lock. So you, you, you need almost 50% more runway. So what does that mean? So uh, we take our 605, and we calculate it out, and we need... 877 feet. Our total accelerate stop distance is now 962. And that what I did was I said, we're going to accelerate. It's going to take us two seconds to transition from acceleration to deceleration. By the time we make the decision, pull the throttle back, the prop slows down. It's probably four seconds. I just said, let's make it two seconds. So I added an extra couple hundred feet. Look at that difference. Are you going to bet the, the integrity of your airplane on 20 feet? In other words, you cannot safely accelerate stop on this runway in this airplane under these conditions. You can't take off and you can't accelerate stop 
don't use this runway. Maybe 20 degrees cooler and so on. You do, of course, have other options. Guess what? You could take off that way, much less than the way of obstacles. And you're lucky because you also have a paved runway you could take off north-south. So in this case, you have other options. But if you don't calculate that out in advance, you might end up like the Lance, who didn't possibly know where they should have been off the ground. They're like, OK, this is a little bit too far. I better reject. And then it was too late to reject. OK, we're going to have to fly here because I got like seconds left. So um, let me zip to kind of the end. So I basically, I just want to, uh, this is my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and also, I did Power Loss at 300 Feet on Mentor Live by Zoom last year, I think. So it's Mentor Live Program 52. So if you want to take pictures of this so you can get to that, that would be great. And then I'll go to the next page for your wings credit. Uh, so I uh, hope I've given you some ideas about how to predict your, uh, how to do your takeoffs, right? What to watch for. Um, how to predict your, uh, your reject point, uh, practice rejecting, right? If you've never done it, you got a nice big long runway, grab an instructor if you don't feel safe doing it, and just practice that. Go up to 30 knots, pull it back, make sure you can control it and get the thing stopped. Do it at 40 knots, 50, anything below rotation speed, pull it back and make sure you have room to stop. So if you're going to do it on your own, you know, sneak up on it like that. Otherwise, grab an instructor. So fly safe, predict your takeoffs, verbalize, use the production effect. I hope to see you next year. Thank you for your attention.